Hello, and welcome to another lesson about language and social issues. In this lesson, we're going to talk about some of the aspects of English pronunciation that most commonly vary across different dialects of English. And so we're not going to address specific dialects in this video, but we're going to talk about some of the things that you may want to be thinking about when you think about the pronunciation associated with a specific dialect. So recall from our previous lesson that when we're talking about the aspect of a dialect that is its pronunciation, the pronunciation associated with a particular language variety, that's when we're talking about an accent. And when we're talking about an accent, that means if you ask people from three different dialect groups to say the same sentence, like it's a pity that I can't go to the party, so you get an American and a British person and an Australian to all say that sentence, they're not going to pronounce that sentence the same way. And that doesn't have anything to do with the words that are part of their dialect. It doesn't have anything to do with any grammatical constructions that are part of their, that dialect. That just has to do with pronunciation. And so that's what we're going to talk about in this video. We're going to talk about th four things that are commonly pronounced differently in different dialects of English. And those four most common sources of variation are the vowel system, Roticity, we'll talk about all these terms later on in the video, allophones of T, and dental fricatives. So if you don't understand these words, that's all right. We're going to go into what these words mean. But these are four aspects that tend to differ quite commonly across different varieties of English. And uh, we will talk about how to think about these different aspects. But before we can start just diving into the vowels, we have to solve a particular problem that we have. So this issue is that when you hear an American, a British person, and an Australian pronounce the word or the sentence, it's a pity that we, I couldn't go to the party. So for example, American, it's a pity that I can't go to the party. And the British person, it's a pity that I can't go to the party. And the Australian, it's a pity that I can't go to the party. You can definitely hear those differences in pronunciation. There's no doubt that you can hear those differences in pronunciation. But when you write them down, you write them all the same way, right? And that's because we've standardized the orthography, the way that we write down English, so that you spell the word the same way, regardless of how you pronounce it, right? So regardless of what pronunciation scheme you're using, the word pity is always going to be spelled the same way across different dialects. So we need some way that we can represent the differences between those dialects in our, our way of writing. We need some phonetic system that we can write down those differences in pronunciations. And in linguistics, when we want to write down the pronunciation of anything that anyone says, we use a system called the IPA. And the IPA stands for International Phonetic Alphabet. It's essentially just a way of writing that lets you write each sound with a single symbol. So what these words stand for, International Phonetic Alphabet, the international part means that you can use it to represent any language. So even though Arabic is usually written in a different script than English, you can use the International Phonetic Alphabet to write both Arabic and English. Um, next, it's phonetic, which means that the symbols are mapped to sounds. Um, so if you have one symbol, it's always going to represent the same sound, no matter what what context it's in. Um, and it's an alphabet, which means that symbols map to phonemes. So it's possible to have a phonetic script where you have one symbol that stands for pob or something like that. That whole chunk is pob, right? Um, in an alphabet, you have one symbol stands for p instead of pob, right? So you'd have three symbols for p, a, and b in an alphabet. So that's what international phonetic alphabet means. So this means that, for example, when we're transcribing somebody speaking standard American English, we can represent the difference between the T sound in the word top and in the word stop. So if you put your hand in front of your mouth when you say the word top, you can feel that there's a puff of air after the T. There's, there's, there's a puff of air that gets released. When you put your hand in front of your, your mouth when you say the word stop, you don't feel that puff of air. And so if you actually listen to the t in top, it sounds like t. When you listen to the t in stop, it sounds more like d, 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 right? There's much less of a puff of air. Um, and we can represent this using the IPA by transcribing the t in top like this, top, that H means that you get the puff of air, and the T in stop with a simple T, right? Now, there are other things that this lets us deal with in the orthography of English. So, for example, T is also used in the word water, 
right? But if you listen to how you pronounce the T in water, it actually sounds sort of almost like a D sound, right? It's ara, 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 um, or like the R from Spanish. We'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, this we represent with another symbol, right? So this is this symbol, right? Um, you can you can look at some examples in English like this and think, where where you have a T, but the sound that it actually makes. So you have a T in the orthography, but the sound it makes is not a sound that we think of as being a T. These sounds each have their own letter. So this is spelled with an ETH symbol. So that stands for the th, the, the one where your where your throat is buzzing, and then uh, a theta is used for the one where your throat isn't buzzing. So the th, one that's just the hissy sound, right? So this and think. Um, and this also lets us get around problems in our orthography like match, where we have a whole clump of letters that we know predictably that when you get a TCH, you get a CH sound. Um, but the T is not really part of that, or CH, CH should be able to represent that, right? So this lets us get around problems in our orthography and just write that CH sound always with the same symbol. All right, um, and there are, of course, more places that we can do this, but this is why we like the IPA. It lets us get to actual pronunciation differences, even if we write it using all the same letter. Now, the IPA is a fairly complicated system, and if you take a phonetics class, a class in how to, uh, how to deal with the sounds of pronounced language, you will definitely learn about this, but you'll probably take three or four weeks to, to cover the IPA in, in depth. Um, in this class, I'm not going to hold you responsible for being able to freely recall IPA stuff or even to fully understand it, but I am going to use the IPA when I'm talking about things. So if you're somebody who's not taken at least an introduction to linguistics class, I suggest that you go watch a video tutorial about the IPA, um, or I will provide you with um, some optional readings so that you can practice with it so it won't be so frightening when you see it. Um, the good thing is that most of the consonants that we use that are not vowels um, are at least more or less like standard English orthography. So you can more or less guess from the from the from the consonants what the or what the pronunciation is going to be at least with the consonants. Um, the same is not true of the vowels. But we're going to go over the vowels in a little bit of depth. Um, I am going to ask that you at least know what the vowels for English are because it will really help you for the next several weeks of this class. So without further ado, let's start talking about the vowels of English. So when we look at how the IPA deals with vowels, um, the IPA vowel chart has a shape that's more or less like this, right? So it's this sort of trapezoid shape divided into regions. Um, and what this stands for is that on the left side, you get the front of your mouth, right? And on the right side, it's the back of your mouth. So you want to think of this as, as uh, the, looking at someone's mouth from the side where the, where the side on the left is the front of their mouth and the side on the right is the back of their mouth and on top is, is high in the mouth and on the bottom is low in the mouth. And then we're going to lay the symbols out on this, on this table um, with regard to where your tongue is in your mouth when you say those vowels. Now this is not a perfect approximation, but that's the idea that they're trying to portray or that more or less gets portrayed is that when you have the, your tongue high up in your mouth toward the front, you're going to get one kind of vowel quality like E. And when you have your, your tongue low in your mouth and at the back, you're going to get aw, right? And you can feel it when you say those vowels that you're moving your tongue around in your mouth. So that's what this chart vaguely means. Now, when we look at most languages of the world, you get the following vowels in most languages of the world. You get an E vowel, as in beat. Um, you get an A vowel, as in bait. Right? So this is not everyone's pronunciation of bait. So we'll talk about this later, but this is some pr people's pronunciations. If you're from Minnesota, for example, you're going to pronounce the word bait as bait. Right? Um, you get an O vowel, as in boot. You get an O vowel, as in boat. Again, this is sort of a Minnesota pronunciation of boat. We'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, and you get an A vowel, as in bot. Right? So these vowels are all vowels of English. Um, and most languages use only these vowels. And this is where we get the, the 
orthographic, the writing, the written vowels of English is from this type of vowel system, E, A, I, O, U, right? So when people say the vowels of English are E, A, I, O, and U, it's true that when we write things down, those are the vowels of English. And that's because the English orthography was created for a language with a system like this that had only five vowels. For a five vowel system, you need only five symbols to represent your five vowels. But unfortunately, English actually has far more than five vowels. So let's talk about how we know that and what those vowels are. So English, in addition to having beat, bait, bot, boot, and boat, has bit, which we put right there, bet, which we put right there, bat, which we put right there, book, which we put right there, uh, but, which we put right there. Now, sometimes when you look at the word but, um, when you look at this sound, you'll also see sort of an upside down V sound. Um, some people who use British English very much care about this. For this for this class, we're just going to use the schwa vowel, which is this upside down E to represent any sort of uh, kind of think of it as the no vowel vowel, right? You're not doing anything to make that vowel. It's just you, your tongue is just neutral, uh, right? But um, bot, which can be sort of an ought, bot, or it can be ought, bot, right? Depending on your dialect. Many of you, since this is a class in Arizona, will pronounce this as just bot, right? Um, but you do need at least either aw or ah in order to represent English fairly well, right? So these are a lot more vowels than we have symbols for. And so the result is that we, many of our vowels we have to represent through like combinations of vowels or funny little O-U-G-H things, right? So there are a lot of ways that we've come up with to deal with the fact that the, the writing system that we have for English only has those five vowels. Um, but the reality is we have a lot of vowels in English and that's not all. We also have diphthongs which are sort of slidey vowels. So these are vowels that start in one place and end up in another place in your system. Um, so for example, we have the vowel in bite, which starts out as ah or ah, bite, and then ends up as e as in like beat, bite, right? Um, so this is a sliding one. Um, we have bait, which starts out as a, right? So this is how most people in American English pronounce the word bait is a rather than a, which is the Minnesota pronunciation bait. Most people pronounce it as bait. Um, we also have the boat pronunciation that most people have rather than if, if you're not from Minnesota, you'll say the word boat as boat, oat, right? It slides. Um, bout, as in, you know, a bout of fighting, right? It, it starts out as ow, and then slides all the way up, ow, right? And lastly, we have the best one of all of them, which is the boy diphthong, where it starts out oi, and ends up over there, right? So we have all these complicated vowel things going on, and our the number of symbols that we have in the orthography is not enough to represent those. So so when you when when we deal with vowels, we're really going to use the IPA. So I would like you guys to all learn this particular chart. I will post just a picture of this particular chart so that you guys can practice with this. Um, but these are the vowels of English. So in order to represent English, you need to know at least like 11 vowels, right? So in order to be an English speaker, somewhere around 10 or 11 pure vowels you need um, to speak English. Um, and this is surprising because the average number of vowels that a language has that you need to know in order to speak that language is about five, right? So this is what's called a crowded vowel space, right? So you can think of this like this. So imagine you have a room in your house and you fill it up with balloons, right? And then anytime anyone like moves anyth anything in that room, all those balloons are all going to jostle around and move around. And so th for this reason, um, 
the English vowel system is very much like that. There's not much room in your mouth, right? And so anytime you change any aspect of the vowel system, you're going to jostle around the whole rest of the vowel system. So the English vowel system is considered to be fairly unstable. Um, and for this reason, varieties of English often have very different pronunciations of English vowels. And so this is the place where you will see the most variation between different accents of English is in how you pronounce the vowels of the language. Um, so they jostle around. Um, and arguably, this feature of English that, that the vowel system varies a lot is caused by its typological features, so the number of vowels that it has. Um, so this is one place where we will look when we talk about a particular dialect. We'll look at how the vowel system has, it has developed, is developing, you know, will develop in the future. All right, so that was a little bit overwhelming. Let's move on to something a little bit more simple and a little more easily identifiable, um, which is called roticity. So roti what is roticity? This is not a word that you're, you've probably heard before. Um, let's explain. Roticity is what we think of most often as the primary difference between an American accent and a British accent. So if we asked an, a speaker of American English to say the word R, they would pronounce it like I just did, as R, R. If we asked a British speaker to pronounce this word, on the other hand, you would probably get ah. Right? So roticity is this quality that some dialects pronounce all the R's and other dialects don't pronounce the R's as R's, right? And that's what our roticity is. So a, a dialect that pronounces all the R's is called a rhotic dialect and a dialect that skips over or um, compensates for some of the R's is called a non-rhotic dialect. Now we think of this as a difference between American English and British English because it's a difference between standard American English and standard British English. But the reality is there are many dialects of American English that are non-rhotic and there are many dialects of British English that are rhotic. Um, so this is just a, a, a distinction between dialects. It's not a British American distinction necessarily. So we will talk about American English dialects that are non-rhotic and we'll talk about British English dialects that are rhotic. So it's tempting to represent this distinction between rhotic and non-rhotic accents as simply people with rhotic accents say the R's, people with non-rhotic accents don't say the R's, but that's clearly not the case. So if, for example, we ask an American and a British speaker to both say the word rat, they'll produce the same word, rat and rat. Both of them will say the R in that context. Similarly, if we ask both an American and a British person to say prep, we get prep and prep. The R gets pronounced in both contexts. So if we're going to describe what is roticity, we have to describe in particular um, which R's get dropped, right? So some of the R's are going to be dropped, some of them are not going to be dropped, and we have to figure out which ones get quote unquote dropped. So which R's get dropped? This is the general rule, so I'm going to explain this rule in a second, but this is the general rule that we use for this, this quality of roticity. All right, so what this rule means is that basically if you take any word in a rhotic language, any time that you have an R that's either between a vowel and a consonant or after a vowel and before the end of the word, any time that in the rhotic language you would have an R there, in the non-rhotic language, you get no R, but the vowel is long, right? And so what that means is that you sort of stretch out the vowel a little bit longer. This is called compensatory lengthening. Um, if you like phonetics or phonology, that's what that is. That means you stretch out the vowel to sort of indicate that there is an R there that you're not pronouncing, right? So that's what this rule means. It means that anytime you have a word like R, where the word ends in an R sound, er, R, right, and that's the end of the word, in, in a non-rhotic accent, um, that would be dropped, R becomes ah, um, and anytime you have a word like cart, where you have an R in between a vowel and a consonant, A, R, T, you get caught, 
right? So you drop the R in that con in that context as well. And in both of those, we write in in sort of standard orthography the the silly way that we represent British accents is often by adding an H in there um, to signify that that vowel is particularly long. So um, so you get a long vowel but no R in those two contexts. Anywhere else, the R is preserved. If, if the R is between two vowels, for example, you keep the R, right? So in any other context besides these two contexts, you keep the R. So these are the only places where the R gets deleted. So let's practice these a little bit. We're gonna go through a couple of words um, and talk about how you would figure out whether someone speaking a non rhotic dialect would pronounce the R in, in, that, in that word. So the first word we're going to look at is rascal. So um, in a rhotic dialect like standard American English, this is pronounced something like rascal, right? So you get this R here at the beginning of the word. Now, if we look up at our rules, there is no rule that would delete the R at the beginning of a word. And so we can predict that someone speaking a non rhotic dialect would preserve that R. So rascal would be pronounced the same way in American English and British English. Let's try another word. Shipwreck. So here we have an R sound in the middle of the word, right? So here's how you would pronounce it in a standard American English accent, ship and then wreck, right? It's in the middle of the word, but if we look up at our, at our rules, you only are gonna delete the R after a vowel. And since in this case, we have an R after a consonant, we are not gonna delete it. And so in British English, we also get shipwreck. It's the same way, it's, it's the same pronunciation. Let's try Sarah. All right, so in uh, standard American English, we pronounce this as Sarah, right? Now let's look up at our, at our chart. We have, um, we have, in this case, we have it following a vowel, right? Which is the first thing that's necessary, but this R is not at the end of the word. So the first rule doesn't apply and it doesn't come before a consonant. And so the second rule doesn't apply either. And so we can predict that in a non rhotic dialect like British English, you would also pronounce it as Sarah. Now in British English, um, the reality is that the, the vowel here is somewhat different, but that's okay. That's just a, that's, a, that's another variation thing. It has nothing to do with the R-lessness. Okay, now let's try the name Mark. All right, so in standard American English, this is pronounced exactly how the same way that you write it in, um, in normal orthography. We have M-A-R-K. Um, this is following a vowel, so it's worth looking at our rules. Um, and we look that our rules say before the end of the word or before a consonant. And since K is a consonant, we will guess that in British English, someone would drop this particular R using compensatory lengthening. So it becomes mock, right? Um, this is something that, that, um, that does in fact happen. Um, how about the word more? So in, in standard American English, this is pronounced as more, um, and surely enough, since this is between a vowel and the end of a word, in British English, this is just mole, right? So this is how you figure out roticity. If it's in that context that says you should delete it, you delete it, otherwise you keep it. Um, now, unlike the, the vowel discussion that we had before, where it was a feature of the language that the vowel system is just unstable because there's so many of them. This is just something that happened in British English at some point and has spread to some of the dialects of English and not to others. So um, this is this roticity variation is not caused by typological features of the language. This is just something that is not in all the dialects and is in some of the dialects. Um, but you should be aware of it because it's it's a very common way that dialects of English will vary is in terms of their roticity. All right, on to the next way that languages vary. They vary in terms of how they pronounce T in different contexts in, uh, when surrounded by different letters, right? So that's what it means to be an allophone is that we think of all of these different sounds as being T's, but we don't pronounce them all the same way. So th this is one of the ways that dialects vary is in terms of how T's are pronounced in different contexts. So let's look at an example of this. So we actually heard a couple examples of how T's are pronounced differently in different dialects. Um, in that first clip about pity that you can't go to the party, um, 
from, from that earlier slide. So the first place where we can hear this is in the word pity. So in American English, we have a pronunciation of pity that sounds like this. Pity. Right? Um, in British English, on the other hand, the T in the middle of pity sounds very different. So listen to that. Pity. Right? So pity versus pity. Right? Um, now, using the IPA, we write that the sound, pity, um, with, this little, with this little hook symbol. Um, and this stands for um, a tap sound, or it's sometimes called a flap sound. And that's where you just sort of let your, the tip of your tongue bang against the roof of your mouth without actually holding it, right? So in a T sound, you hold your tongue against the roof of your mouth and let it go. And in a flap sound, you just bang it up there once. Um, and this sound is actually, um, in most languages of the, of the world, used to represent an R sound. So in the Spanish word pata, it's the same sound that you get here, right? So it's a it's often a variant pronunciation of R in American English and in many other dialects of English, it's a variant of, of a T sound. So you see this in pity. Now you also see this word, this, this um, funny variant pronunciation of T. You also see it in the pronunciations of the word party. So this is pronounced in American English as party party, just like I pronounce it, and in British English as party. So party and party. So this is this is a common thing that happens to T's in the middle of words um, in English. But this doesn't affect every time we get a T in the middle of a word, just like broticity didn't affect every time you get an R, right? So if we look at the word return, both an American and a British person would pronounce the T as a T return, return, right? So in this case, the British person is being affected by the fact that their accent is non neurotic but the T is the same in both dialects. So we have to ask the question, when do T's get changed and when do T's not get changed? So the place where this most commonly happens is this. When you have a T between two vowels, where the second vowel is an unstressed syllable. This is the place where it almost always happens in American English. Um, and this is the, the, the case for pity, right? So in pity, the second syllable is less stressed than the first syllable. Um, and so you get the, you get the, the, this change, this flapping of the T, pity. Um, in American English, we often also get it in places where we have a vowel and then an R and then a T and then an unstressed syllable. So this is the case in party. Um, but this is not always the case, right? So this has a little bit of, um, of weirdness to it. Now there are some cases where it looks like we're almost to flapping the T, but it hasn't really happened or it's optional or it's vague, right? So unlike roticity where it's fairly, um, the, the places where you get it and don't get it are fairly strongly predictable. With with T flapping, it's it's got some weirdness to it. So for example, if we look at the word 70, 70, um, the, if you think of the fanciest pronunciation of this word in American, American English, it would be 70, right, with a T. Most people do not pronounce it that way. It sounds a little bit British, actually, to pronounce the word 70 with a T. Um, most naturally, we pronounce it with a D, 70, right? So this is sort of part way toward a flap, but it still is a D sound. It's not a 70, 70, 70, right? You don't say 70, right? You say 7D. Um, there's also a pronunciation where you can completely drop that T sound, which is 70, 70. Um, and in this case, we can think of this as actually being a flap that you just can't really hear because of the way that you say the N is too similar, right? So there is some optionality in American English about how you want to choose to pronounce the word 70. Um, uh, and, and so this shows you that, that this flapping of T is not as predictable as, as, as roticity. So when we're looking at dialects of English, we want to think about two things. The first thing that we want to think about is does T change in the middle of words? And if so, where does that happen, right? So does T change in, in the middle of words in um, different dialects? This varies. So if we look at the pronunciations of water and butter, um, where, 
whether or not we flap the T is going to be different in different dialects. So in American English, we flap the T in both these words, both water and butter. In Australian English, though, you flap the T in butter, but not in water. So in, in, in Australian English, it's butter, but it's, but it's water, right? So, so it's, it seems fairly randomly assigned whether you're flapping it or not. Um, and in British English, of course, you don't flap it anywhere. So this is one thing that you want to ask when you're looking at a dialect of English, is to what extent are you flapping or altering the T's in between vowels? Um, the other question that you want to ask is actually what happens to the T? So in most varieties, the thing that happens in this context is it becomes a flap like this. But that's not true in every variety of English. In some varieties, something different happens to it. So in American English, in, in the word pity, you flap the T. But in Cockney English, which is London English, it often becomes a glottal stop, right? So instead of saying pity, you say pity. E. You stop the air and then let it start again. Pity. -e. That's a pity, -e, right? So what happens in that context is sometimes different, right? So these are things to look for when you're looking at a dialect. So unlike roticity, where there's a fairly strict set of rules that you can say this is rhotic, this is non-rhotic, um, this sort of watching what happens to the T's between vowels is just something that you just want to watch. There's not a clear, there's not clear categories that dialects fall into, but this is a place where dialects vary a lot is in terms of what they do with these T's. All right, so we're going to finish off with a fairly simple one, which is the dental fricative. So standard English, most varieties of standard English have two sounds in them that are called dental fricatives. And these sounds are the sound in that, which we write with this symbol, and the sound in think, which we write in this sim with this symbol. And we know that these are two different symbols, even though we write them in our orthography, both with th, because this phrase, thistle, is not the same thing as thistle, right? These are not the same word. Thistle and thistle are different words. Um, and so we know that these are distinct. And the reason that we call these dental fricatives has to do with how they're pronounced. So when you say them, when you say these sounds, you sort of put the tip of your tongue between your teeth, your dent. Dental means tooth related, right? So a dental fricative means you make a hissy sound between your teeth. That's all that, that means. Um, and so these are two sounds that we have in standard English that often are, are, are changed in different varieties of English. And the reason that these two sounds are often changed is again a typological concern. So if we look at the word world's languages, it turns out that only 4% of the world's languages have dental fricatives, so sounds that are made in this way where you stick the tip of your tongue between your teeth and you make a hissy sound. Uh, and so what this means is that it's hard for new people to learn. And so any dialect where historically or currently or at any time new people were, were, were using that language variety, new speakers of the language are using that variety, or even just people who were bilingual in another language were using that language variety, these often are hard for people who are second language speakers to pronounce, and so dialects will pick up new pronunciations for these. So many varieties alter these sounds to be more like other languages cross-linguistically. So when we look at the standard American English pronunciation of the word think, it looks like this, think, um, and this uses the ev symbol because it's a buzzy one, th, um, this. Um, but if we look at Cockney English, um, especially historical varieties of Cockney English, so some modern varieties of Cockney English have preserved this, um, you get think. What do you think about that with an F? Um, and, and sometimes even this. This is my friend, right? You don't get this, you get this. Um, some dialects will even just drop this sound, this particular sound. So is, they'll say is instead of this, right? Um, and if we look at, at, at Indian English, the language spoken in India, you get tink. Um, this is just replaced with a T and dis, right? Um, this is a common way that this is um, in, in the world's English languages. You often get tink and dis for these for these particular words, right? So um, oftentimes a, a, a dialect of English will replace these two sounds, the th and the th sound, with something more pronounceable for speakers who grew up speaking another language. 
So in this lesson, we've talked about the four places where English dialects tend to vary in terms of their pronunciation. And these ways were the vowel system, where vowels tend to slide around because the system is such a crowded vowel space. Um, we talked about roticity, which was a change that happened at some point in British English and spread to some dialects, but not others. We talked about the allophones of T, which um, T, particularly in the middle of words, tends to drift around, um, and it does so differently in different dialects. And we talked about dental fricatives, which are modified often in, in dialects that have a lot of contact with non-native English speakers because these sounds are particularly hard for non-native speakers to pronounce. Um, now, I gave you a lot of information in this in this lesson. Um, I'm not expecting you to fully grasp all the details, um, but this should get you oriented so that when I say in a future lesson the vowel space is moving because of the overcrowded vowel system, you'll have some understanding of what that means. And when I say this is a rhotic accent um, and maybe don't specifically talk about the details of what roticity means every time you'll be able to go back and refer to this lesson um, to, to learn about roticity. Um, now for most of the dialects that we'll talk about in the next several lessons we'll also have other other um, pronunciation differences that I didn't talk about here um, but we will almost certainly discuss each of these variation points um, for each of the dialects and so uh, this should be this lesson should serve as your cheat sheet that you can come back to in order to figure out what I'm talking about when I talk about each of these things. So I hope you enjoyed the lesson.